Hello and welcome to our Thursday evening uh, evening here in the UK live stream. And uh, my name is Matthew Reed, and we run uh, a brand, a pretty informal thing called How to Repair Pendulum Clocks. And this is uh, an occasional event that um, uh, that relates to that brand. And for the past few months now, we have had um this american clock just need to get my there we go this american clock you can see the frame here um on our bench and we've been working through various uh clock making challenges including a bit of bushing a bit of cleaning repairing the case and last week in fact for the last couple of weeks we've been talking about the escapement this clock has got a uh, deadbeat escapement Hi, Franklin. Good to see you, Mark and Sam. West Wales wet. There's a surprise. It's cracking flags here in York and Daryl. Hey. Hi, Daryl. Thank you for joining us. Um, so, yeah, a pretty steady pre-Christmas um, amble tonight. <laughs> Not that it's ever planned or anything. So last week we got to the stage where... Um, we looked at our escapement and we realized that the pallet frame, this chap here, has been bent back. You can see the arms of the pallet frame are kind of not straight. Um, and one of the acting faces, the, I've forgotten now, oh, this one, the exit face, I think in terms of... Um, the bending, what's happened, and it's difficult, obviously, to conjecture, but somebody has adjusted the escapement and it's got to the point where it doesn't work. It was binding because they bent their um, arms out. That obviously bends the uh, impulse faces or the active faces out too, which has reduced drop to such a degree that they've um, maybe gotten in a bit of a panic and started filing things. So what they've done is they've filed this... Um, surface here the back of the um let me get this right so the wheel um the back of the exit face yeah that's where we are so there are two ways forward with this and i'm going to try the first of those tonight uh, hi paul and ken good to see you um the first of those is to try and sort of rescue for want of a better word um <coughs> these pallets now, it's going to be a little bit of a shot in the dark, really, because I don't know whether this is going to work or not. I suspect we can get the thing ticking. But the problem with that is those uh, faces that were once dead faces are um, not going to be dead anymore. Not that that makes a massive difference. We've talked about this for a few weeks now, maybe. But the point of the deadbeat escapement is to do with escapement error and the kind of <coughs> perception of, precision so what with this clock it doesn't have a subsidiary seconds hand so you wouldn't know whether there was a bit of recoil um on the pallets or not ideally we would have it so the pallets were were dead but something that cropped up which i'm going to talk about first and it keeps cropping up on our facebook group so anybody who um is oh yeah we've got team open clock club here tonight because uh work's kind of finished for the time being um so <coughs> they uh 
what we come across on our Facebook group, uh, which is the same name, if anybody's watching this and they don't know about us, uh, please feel free to join us there, um, is that uh, we talk uh, or we hear people talking a lot about something called the Broco escapement, which is analogous to the deadbeat escapement. So I thought it'd be quite fun to talk about the Broco escapement a little bit now, because we spent quite a lot of our time last week talking about the geometry of the deadbeat escapement. So if you get the old um, hat out, <coughs> what we, uh, just to recap, sorry to look off, um, is that we said, just move all this junk out of the way. Let's say uh, this, It's one of our uh, deadbeat escape wheel teeth, and it's going in this direction. Then the, uh, let's say the pallet arbor is somewhere up here. The dead face or the locking face as some people call it, of that pallet is um, a common or consistent radius from this point up here. So if we just do a bit of color coding like this, Ooh. it's a common radius. Uh, from this point. And that means that when the uh, escape wheel is resting on that um, dead face, the escape wheel does neither rotate as in impulse or rotate backwards as in recoil. And then our deadbeat pallet, so I've drawn the, um, anyway, I've drawn the <laughs> pallet arbor in a funny place, doesn't matter. Uh, so then we've got something like this. This is one of our pallets. Um, the wheel would actually be going in that direction, but anyway, and so we have got this so-called dead face here and this <coughs> impulse face here. And this value is important to us. The kind of thickness of the palette is important to us in a deadbeat escapement because um, if we draw two teeth, so let's draw... Um, two escape wheel teeth like this. There we are, escape wheel going in this direction. Um, with your pallets, basically um, the pitch of the two, so the pitch of the wheel, so that's uh, the value from, let's say, here to here, this is pitch. then um, that has to be, oh, it doesn't have to be anything, but it is occupied by two pallet thicknesses because when um, the clock goes tick and tock, the first, the tooth moves up like this, half a tooth space, then tock, and then half a tooth space up there somewhere. So it makes sense that for one full tooth width or one pitch, you've got two um, thicknesses of pallet in there, minus drop. Um, yeah, minus drop. Okay, so I'll just draw those in. So we've basically got, uh, let's just draw one here like this. And then we've got another one here like this. So if you were to chop both pallets off and put them together back to back, they'd, uh, I've drawn it wrong, haven't I? Sorry, they would fill uh, that gap, something like that. Terrible drawing. There's one, and there is the other. Less a bit for drop. If you filled the entire gap, the escapement couldn't work um, because there's no drop there. Drop is free rotation of the escape wheel and the train um, immediately before the pallet lands on the dead face and you get the tick and talking sound. Okay, so in a broco, <laughs> escapement we've got a very similar hi del um we've got a very similar kind of looking escape wheel and people often refer to the broco escapement so this is the kind of thing that's often a visible escapement but not always on french clocks and um people often call it a deadbeat escapement uh, but it's not a deadbeat escapement uh, there is a little bit of impulse or recoil as we will see so for people who um haven't seen this. Let's just say we've got exactly the same escape wheel. So uh, here's a tooth, oops, like that. And here's another tooth like that. Same thing, wheel going in a clockwise direction. So 
<coughs> rather than um, the palate phase uh, being struck from our uh, center, which is somewhere up here, the palate arbor, um, we have, um, if you imagine, on our, I won't go back to that, but if you imagine the deadbeat escape that we're familiar with, it's basically points in space. It's a point there and a point there. The shape of the tooth is irrelevant because it just creates just something to hold that active surface in place as we um, as it moves through space. And um, so, and the same thing with the uh, with the with the Broco uh, type escapement, but. With a deadbeat escapement, that point in space, this point here and this point here, the only active part of the tooth, slides along this arc that's a common or consistent radius from the palate arbor. So when it's dead, it doesn't recoil, it doesn't impulse. Very different or subtly different on the Broco escapement, because on the Broco escapement, our palates are a pair of D-shaped pins. So they are something like uh, this. Um, and if we were to draw another one in there, it would be a, something like that. So exactly the same uh, theory applies. Two of these pins, are then, they're not together like that. In uh, reality, they're spread apart over N and a half teeth. But let's say uh, if we put them back to back, they too occupy one pitch minus drop. Now you might say, well, Matthew, why are you banging on about this? And the reason I'm banging on about it is because a lot of people uh, get these French clocks and the pallets are made out of agate or synthetic ruby or something. So some incredibly hard, but incredibly brittle material. And they get broken off for whatever reason, either somebody pushing the pendulum or moving the clock with the pendulum on or whatever, drop them on the floor and they get broken off. And um, when you come to, I actually should have looked before I went online, but there you go. When you come to replace the pallets, I think they're only available in kind of standard sizes. So if you imagine um, you get uh, a, a replacement jewel or pallet um, and it's smaller diameter than this, let's say it's like that, um, the value there from there to there, which is our impulse space, the impulse space on these pallets is that bit there, and that bit there, you've still got an impulse space and it's still going to land about in the same place if you glue it in, they're usually held in with shellac in the pallet frame. But the problem is you're going to have a lot more drop because you've got this extra material here. So um, there's going to be more drop. More drop equals loss of energy and less impulse. So the clock won't run as well, all things being equal. So, and if you go with um, a pallet that's bigger in diameter, like this, then that's all well and good, but you don't have any drop and therefore the uh, escapement won't work at all. It'll just jam. So you just cause more problems. So what I've seen a lot uh, in a case like this, where you can only get pallet stones that are a bigger diameter, is that people put the stone in the frame and they rotate it. So rather than it being like this, and we've got our escape wheel tooth lands here, and it slides down here as the pallet rotate as the pallet frame rotates and it drops off in that direction. Rather than it being like that, I've seen this pallet stone rotated in the frame like that to decrease this value here. And to a degree, that uh, that works. That's fine. Um, it does mean that this value <clears throat> is also increased. So very fractionally, the amount that they Pallet frame has to rotate uh, in order for the escapement to operate has also increased as well. Anyway, so what am I getting at there? Well, first thing is uh, you can see here maybe that as the um, the clock ticks and uh, a, an escape wheel tooth, let's say this one, 
lands on the palate. And then the pendulum momentum uh, keeps the pendulum swinging a little bit further, and therefore it keeps the palate frame rotating a bit further. And during that phase, because this face here is straight and not curved, you can't arrange it, the escapement, so there is neither impulse or recoil. You can have one or the other, or you can even have it so it starts off as impulse and start and ends up in recoil. Um, but you can't have something that's traveling in a curve, traveling along a straight line, and this palette not move. It's, it's um, impossible. And for that reason, the Broco escapement, for what it matters, probably, uh, at least in theory, is a bit like a deadbeat escapement. But the reality is, um, no, I don't think so. I've just got a bit of a cough. Um, it's, it's that time of year when I just need to have a bit of a rest. Maybe. <laughs> if I look like I'm ill, I probably do, actually, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, I'm still smiling. The, uh, so anyway, so when you read that the Broco escapement describes the deadbeat escapement, you can go, ha, being a pedant, it, um, it isn't uh, quite. And the other thing you can do, if you come across a Broco escapement and the jewels are broken or one of the pallet stones is broken, yeah, you can go to a supplier. And I don't know what graduations of um, sort of diameters you can actually get. No idea. But um, I would just make it out of blued steel or silver steel. If you've got access to a lathe, you can um, turn the, let the steel down as in anneal it, turn it down to diameter, polish it, file away half of the stone to create clearance, and then harden it dead hard. It won't be quite as hard as, um, oh, I've had a test as well. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, anyway, you can um, harden it dead hard and leave it dead hard. And TBH, that will be as good as a, a jewel. It won't look quite as nice. Um, the problem is that sometimes these uh, statements are uh, visible. So um, I don't know what you would do there. But anyway, so a little rant about the Broco uh, escapement. It's not a deadbeat escapement. And if you get one that's got broken jewels, my advice would be to replace those jewels with um, a bit of blue steel or silver steel that's hardened out dead hard. Okay, so I'm going to jump in with our um, anchor recoil escapement. The entry palette, probably can't see there because it's teeny weeny, um, has got a bit of wear on it and it's a bit squidgy because somebody has um, filed it or something. I'll just get an eyeglass. Yeah, they've really filed it and um, rounded it off. It's a, I think maybe you can see there. It's a really kind of crazy sort of curved off shape, which is not, um, which is far from ideal. Let's deal with our um, exit palette first, which has got, I think I, um, I, I've described what's happened before, but I'll just draw it again very quickly. So the, um, the, because the, the escapement is effectively upside down in this plot compared to what I'm used to. Um, the entry palette is here. And the exit palette is here. So we've got uh, impulse face there, that goes around there. And we've got an impulse face there. And um, what's happened is this is uh, squidged over. So here's our little thing and here's the, um, crutch. Um, but this one, I think what's happened is they've got it into such a state where um, when there's an escape wheel tooth here, this one is jamming on the back. So they've filed that down like that, which means that there's about a third of the original impulse face. So I'm going to try and do, and it may be a complete disaster, but I've got nothing to lose here because um, what the heck is a uh, if it doesn't work, I'm going to have to make a new pair of palettes and do a drawing and all that stuff, is I'm going to file this back 
until we've got a 45 degree impulse face there. And I might also file this back a little bit um, in order to kind of square up that side on the basis that it's soft enough that I can file it. Of course, the trouble is if you file these things back as has already happened here, you've got no impulse because the pallets are effectively too far away from the wheel. So you then either have to move this in that direction, which I don't want to do if I can help it, or you bend the pallets in like this, which is a terrible thing to do because it's going to destroy our dead faces. But um, we're kind of at the point of no return, really. So I'm just going to see whether these faces are actually uh, dead hard or not. And I will just triple, double, triple check that I'm filing off the right side. So I'll just assemble the frame. Do, do. Come, sir. Yeah, I think it was last Christmas, wasn't it? We were kind of sort of in totally locked down. So this Christmas isn't quite as bad, but it's getting on that way. Nuts. <coughs> Not much cough nowadays. <laughs> Doing my thing. Ooh. Nobody mentioned fisherman's friends. I'll just uh, pop a nut on the back of there. Since that's Christmas. Oh, sorry. Okay, don't spin the wheels. Let's just pop this badger on here. And there is the tiniest amount of engagement of the pallets. So maybe this clock would just about tick, but there's loads of drop and there's hardly any impulse. So we want to improve these working surfaces. I wouldn't normally file the pallet frame. It's been done before. Now I'm going to bend uh, these straight again. And hopefully that will generate uh, some kind of um, safe locking and some impulse as well. Who knows? A voyage of discovery. So the first thing to do is to check and see whether... I'm going to file them at a kind of arbitrary 45 degrees. I'm not massively uh, fussed about this, um, but 45 degrees impulse face is what we want in relation to the dead face. And um, you could make a jig if you were making, uh, in fact, when in the college, when students used to make a deadbeat escapement for the British Horological Institute final grade, I think it was, they would make a, a jig to grind or turn or file the pallets. I'm not going to do that here. I'm just going to uh, eyeball it like that. Could get a, and we'll see. I'm doing the um, entry palette now that's been filed over. Probably destroying my file. Yeah, it is. It's actually quite hard. And it's barely touching the pallet. So the pallet is, in fact, really hard. So there's two things we could do here. We could either let the pallet down by heating it and um, uh, allowing it to cool slowly. And uh, then we'd have to harden it again at the end of the process. It might be actually worth doing that because um otherwise we're gonna to have to do it with diamond let's just try it with diamond and see how that goes uh again uh, and if it doesn't work we'll have to let it down um the reason why letting it down might be useful is because i have had these pallet frames uh, break before um they're actually that hard so annealing might be useful this time Uh, go with the EZ lap, EZ lap, diamond lap, which has been incredibly useful. I've had these about a year now, I guess. Um, they're a bit worn, but they're still all right. And they've definitely, for jobs like this, have gotten me out of all sorts of holes. The problem with this is 
it's going to be quite squidgy, as in it's not going to be perfectly flat, and etc. Again, if you wanted that, you would really uh, make a jig. I suppose actually what I could do is to arrange the palette so the, uh, the, the, the face I wanted was parallel with the... Um, Yeah, with, with the um, uh, with the jaws. So I'm trying to read the stream as well at the same time. <clears throat> Derek's going to do more updates about his lathe. Yay! Good, good, good. We're jealous. Ultra lathe. The first lathe I ever used as a poultry lathe. We had one of the shop one of those um they call it a poultry 10 which is quite confusing because right? it's an eight millimeter uh lathe actually i think that's just going to take some time but it's all right it's flat enough i don't know whether flat enough is flat enough but um there you go it might have to be um <clears throat> yeah john spice is making the parents christmas We'll just try it like this. And see if that gets a bit squarer. Presumably when these things were made, they obviously they had jigs and so on, which mix. life a lot easier and the the reality is if you're going to make a pair of pallets it's probably worth making well you would have to make some kind of jig to uh to bend them um and then stone them and the beauty is it takes so long to make the jig um oh, ian yeah ian has a poultry 10. i'm kind of quite fond of that lay the idea of it but um i've already got my millimeter laid so don't really need another one <clears throat> well, the one that Derek's got has got a bigger center height, hasn't it? Which is useful. I think that's like the one that John's got. Does yours take 10 millimeter collets, Derek? I can't remember. I think it probably does, uh, like um, John's. Oh, well, that's definitely um, stoning the pallet face uh, flatter, destroying the vice, but here, no, it's a bit of a consumable. much easier uh, with the base jaws like that. That's quite smart. Cool. Well, that's um, a major surprise, but actually uh, the, if we can get it to focus or not, the, um, the impulse face there is actually quite nice and flat. And now it's square or reasonably square with the pallet frame, whereas before it was, um, off to one side. So I'm just going to get the dead your sit stone. The old um Ruby or um oh, no. uh, corundum, synthetic corundum stone. This chap here, uh, which is incredibly useful. Sort of aluminium oxide thing. I'll just put that back in the vice where it was before and just try and stone that to um, Yes, 10 mil and 70 mil centre height. Ah, right, okay, that's really nice. So, same centre height as the old Chablin 70, which is really good, small clock and watch uh, height. It gives you that bit more flexibility than the watchmaker's lathe. I did used to have um, a gap bed lathe or a staggered bed, bed lathe for my 8mm watchmaker's lathe, and I never really knew what it was for, never really used it. 
and for some reason, I was still needed the money. I uh, sold it, and then of course I immediately uh, regretted it. Right, so there we are. Actually, that's um, pretty good. I don't know if you can see that glinting in the light. Um, anyway, it's pretty good, reasonably flat, and no burrs on there. It's just still on the back of it. Well, that's the easy bit because the other side, the exit palette, is much worse. As in, there's a lot more material to remove. And yet, what concerns me is that when I try and straighten the palette frame, it'll break, um, which will be A, embarrassing, and B, means I will have to make a new set of palettes. Right, okay, so I'm going to arrange this. So um, make sure I take the correct side off. So if that is 45 degrees like that, we can do pretty much the same um, operation here. You could put a protractor on there or even better, just make up a little bit of brass um, that's filed to 45 degrees. I'm not particularly bothered about um, that. Masks. Yeah. If you're going to bend straight, should you do that first before filing in case it breaks? Well, that's it would save me time. The problem is until I filed it, I don't know how much I need to bend it. Um, so the problem is that if it breaks, then I um might uh what I might actually do is temper them back to blue. That might just help me a little bit with um, with the uh, sort of hardness of them, just in case they are brittle. Yeah, it's right. If you if I bend them first, at least if they broke, I would know not to bother. But you don't know how much to bend it because it's this material that we're removing um, that's going to dictate uh, the new kind of depth and also drop. So we not only do we have to bend them closer, but we might have to bend them. Um, towards each other or away from each other but yeah i'm going to do that i'm just going to um anneal them you know just back to blue temper them back to blue rather than fully annealing them it might just give me that bit of sort of flexibility now this might take quite a while because there's a lot of material to remove and this little diamond stone is getting quite worn. Again, if you've got one of those tool grinders where you can clamp the thing and grind, that's going to be brilliant for this. Or um, if you're starting with uh, annealed material, new pallets. If you're going to make new pallets and you really have to uh, do a drawing first, otherwise you're pretty much shooting in the dark. Right, okay, that's um, that's all right, actually. That's gotten us about, uh, it was only a third of impulse space. We've now shifted back into the direction. We've got two thirds impulse space on the correct side and one third um, still to go. So I'll just mount them. Is the answer to Derek's question that it would be hard to know how much to bend before you did the filing? Yeah, you couldn't because it's you're talking about such tiny right. amounts, you know, tenth of a millimetre or something. So, yeah, you wouldn't know. Um, if you're making them new, though, what you would do is you'd bend them to shape so they were right for like n and a half teeth. And then you would just file back, file back, file back, file back, like you do with the anchor recoil scheme until they work. Um, but we're not in that situation. Uh, you could bend them in a lot, I suppose, but I don't. This is um, double trouble because we don't know whether they're embracing n and a half teeth or not. And the answer is probably not. A bit more sticking out now, so we'll just take that down. It doesn't take as long as I thought, but this band's done its pretty good hacking the material away. 
trying not to rub on the belly of the palates, and which would make a bit of a mess. I mean, with a, when a, with a job like this, where you're, um, I'm not really that much uh, fond of the idea of rescuing something sort of disaster scenario, but we are in a situation here where we've got so little to lose um, that I'm not particularly bothered. It will just take longer if uh, they do in fact break. Some people might argue that I need the exercise of making new palettes as well. Right, okay, a bit more. Well, again, that's actually surprisingly good. We're about three quarters of the palette thickness now, so one more chunky bit off and we should be sorted. Well, at least for this bit. Now I'm getting the old uh, blood arch out. Right. Yeah, so um, I think we're going to be back next week uh, for our sort of um, not Christmas special, but that time between Christmas and New Year. Then we'll continue with this. If I can get this done tonight, um, I'll try and get the whole thing cleaned up. Oh, the second, I've already done one sort of step of cleaning, but clean the rest. Uh, during the week and then next week we might be able to get it assembled and ticking although I've had very little experience in these clocks so I'll have to practice a bit and uh, great to see uh, lots of people on the Facebook group it's been super busy I guess I don't know whether people are on holiday or whatever but last couple of days it's been um, really good actually we've had uh, 70 new people in the last three days um from all around the world which is fantastic and uh, we've had a nice range of um topics yeah. you know there are some perpetual favorites cleaning mainsprings oiling blah blah, blah. but uh, a few kind of um problems people have as as complete beginners who have inherited clocks nice one this afternoon from some chap in East, uh, who was collecting clocks that were made by his great uncle or fifth great uncle or something and um from east sussex that was nice and again doing this kind of remote uh yeah diagnosis is always good fun right very happy with that gosh it almost looks professional Great. Okay. Well, I thought that was going to be much harder than it, much more difficult, shall I say, uh, than it was. But in fact, camera seems to have uh, called it a day on the focusing front. But you can see the new face that I've ground on there. And um, as long as I've done it on the correct side, uh, we're okay. Uh, it'd be a good idea to vacuum up all this diamond dust that's kicking about. We'll just sort of do the old clock much good. So obviously we've even got less impulse now uh, than we had before because we've ground those surfaces back, those faces back. But uh, yeah, really happy with that. I am well surprised that it was as successful as it was. So I'm just going to um, deburr with the Zeki sit stone on the corner little bit and on the back as well where there's a little uh, don't want to round it and undo our good work but we also don't want any hard burrs on there because that'll cut our uh, escape wheel So let's have a look at this now. Um, I 
Yeah, I mean, on well, you can see there, look, on many teeth, the wheel just completely spins freely. So you get an idea of how little uh, impulse there is. So I'm going to put it, um, it's difficult to say and difficult to see. I'll try and find it. The escape wheel is also quite badly damaged, stroke one. I mean, it's going to have to bend a long way. Yeah, I think highly unlikely this is going to be successful because there's just such a lot uh, to do. So what we're after, I'll try and show you, draw what we've got, and I'll try and draw what we're after. And um, let's just draw this in. So here's our uh, centre up here of our palette. Uh, but, so I'm drawing at the top just because that's how I'm used to seeing it. It's actually completely the way up, but um, let's not do that. Let's draw it the way up it is. So here's the uh, centre of our wheel, and we've got uh, an escape wheel tooth, something like there. Obviously going in that direction, and we've got an escape wheel tooth. Uh, somewhere down here. Let's just count. I think I did count last week, didn't I? How many teeth this thing embraces? It's eight and a half, wasn't it? Let me just remind myself. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight and a half. Yeah, it looks like um, eight and a half uh, tooth spaces that the palettes embrace. So what we've got at the moment, got terrible drawing, sorry, is what we're after, let's draw in our palette here. John says he makes it look very shiny. Yeah. It looks, like new. it looks really good. I'm really surprised. Um, using that vice as a kind of sacrificial jig was really good because it kept it nice and flat. So thank you, Sam. So when this tooth has just landed on the uh, locking face, wants to land about half a degree onto the dead face. This tooth just wants to be uh, exiting. Let me get this right. So it's gonna be, gosh, something like that. Joins a bit. So yeah, when this tooth is just about to land on this uh, dead face here, this tooth, scape wheel's going in this direction, is just exiting and vice versa. So when this tooth has just landed on the dead face there, this tooth um, wants to be exiting there. And then we can worry about drop. There will be drop automatically in this escapement because the pallets are quite thin in relation to the pitch, the thing we talked about before. And what we've got at the moment is when this is touching on here, this is like miles away it is get a little bit of time eyeball it so when that we'll just get half decent tooth is touching on there it's two millimeters away that's quite a lot. So that's kind of a millimetre on his side. So basically, uh, kind of slightly answering Derek's point before about bending it first, I now know, because the faces are quite smart, that in relation to the uh, palette arbor here, this end has got to bend up a millimetre and this end's going to bend up a millimetre. If the back of the palettes wasn't straight as it is, I wouldn't particularly bother and I would try and move the palette arbor, but because they appear to have been bent down, I haven't seen enough of these clocks to know whether that's how they were. I'm going to try and bend them back. Now, the beauty of bending the pallet arbor, of course, the little mounting uh, spigot thing, is that we won't have to bother bending the pallets, but I think we'll have to move them in and out a bit anyway, uh, because... Yeah, we are. So I'm going to do that. Let's just put some extraction on. So we'll try not to set the fire alarm off. 
I'm going to set it off three times this week. Let's just put that down there and get our spirit lamp. The spirit lamp should be um, enough for this because we only want it to be blue. We don't need it to be uh, heated right up. And I think that might be enough to um, help us. Now, the, the slight problem with that is it's going to anneal, sorry, it's going to anneal the um, the brass as well. So those little bushes in the pallets are going to be soft. So might have to rebush it, but that's um, least of our worries at the moment. Moment. Yes, East Yorkshire accent. Christmas, isn't it? You can't use your East Yorkshire accent at Christmas, when can you? So gone. Yeah, it's going to anneal that bit of brass, but um, it's going to get quite far. I can re-harden the palette bases. I'm not um, I think, yeah, shiny. Well, I mean, there's a good question there, Sam, as to whether this plot should be regarded as a, a relic or not. Or whether I should be regarded as a relic or not, I suppose. The answer, of course, is yes, definitely. I don't know. Well, that will have helped it. So it's, as you can see, or you may not be able to see, it's gone actually a nice kind of spring steel blue colour. And on the basis that it's getting incredibly difficult to hold, uh, that's probably enough. Maybe I can splash out. I'll give it a pair of pliers. So let's just see if we can take it through blue. I'm not sure we'll be able to do spirit that. Yeah, so this means we'll have to rebush the um, little uh, bearings there, but that's quite easy. So, yeah, so no longer shiny those palette faces, so nice and blown out. I think that's about our terminal temperature on the spirit lamp. So it'll have to do. Should be pretty well soaked now, at least at that temperature. You can normally bend blue steel like this bit but as we know if you bend mainspring and you try and bend it around it will snap so oh well one way to find out just allow that to cool for a few seconds You're off. Right, so while that's cooling down, let's get rid of that. Give it a tea. Weirdly, it's still warm. So let's find some pliers to grab hold of it with. In the plier drawer, everybody loves in the look in the plier drawer. Mark says so you presume that you've soldered that wire onto the pellets. Why haven't it come up with the heat? It's riveted on. Uh, I haven't done it. It's uh, manufacturers. Yeah, it's um, ah, no, it's not a silly question. Um, no, this uh, is riveted on by the factories, no solder, and the same for this little bracket as well. Uh, that's also uh, riveted on as well. So you're absolutely right, Mark. If it had been soft-soldered on, it would have dropped off, uh, but it's not. So 
So Look here, need some lucky pliers. Right, I'm going to go with those. I think they're the lucky pliers today. In a great and fortunate position of having choice. So I've gone with um, these, which are Elliot Lucas, I think. Yeah, they are. Um, lap jointed pliers, they're quite nice. Got them on eBay as new old stock, and these uh Lindstrom 870s, which are box jointed pliers. So, we've got the battle of the lap jointed, which um, are seen as being cheaper pliers, and people look down the nose at them versus the box jointed. Uh, and yeah, there is actually less play in the Lindstrom pliers as well. Anyway, I'm putting off the breaking bit obviously because i don't want that to happen so let's just have a one last look and then i will actually get on with it instead of procrastinating yeah it needs bending around about two mil so let's just have a look and see how it feels Okay, well, they look um, look better already in as much as they look a bit, you know, they're not bent back on themselves like they were before, apart from the fact that, of course, they're a bit blued. So, I mean, under normal circumstances, obviously never, ever, ever do that and bend or blue or heat anything because it's not necessary. No. In my excitement, I put them on the wrong way around. Spot the deliberate mistake. And it is exciting. Because if we can get this done tonight and I can get the thing cleaned during the week, then bish bash bosh, we can actually get it to you next week. OMG, how good is that? I think that is a case of material memory because um, it's like perfect or as perfect as it's going to be. Uh, it's a pity you can't see. I wonder if it's actually worth faffing about and changing over to the other lens. What do you think, Rachel? Do you have a little comfort break? Yeah. Uh, change over to macro yeah. lens? Yeah. Because um, this is the best achievement of my horror career, which isn't saying much. Right, okay, uh, it's 53. Well, let's have a couple minutes comfort break while I faff about with the lens. And um, because I think it's quite interesting to see uh, what we uh, are hoping to achieve here. Turn off the old uh, back in two minutes. Okay, welcome back from our quick uh, comfort break stroke camera lens uh, changeover. 
I suppose um, if this <laughs> if this whole thing that we do ever kind of gets off the ground, uh, we could we should really go for a multi camera um, uh, experience, and then we can use one of those what they call black magic switching things and just press the button and change over. But anyway, until that point, we are a little bit stuck with what we've got. I'm just going to get a three, two, one block. And these um, wooden blocks, incredibly useful, just a piece of wood, um, but they are really, really useful. Okay, cool, nice shot, if I do say so myself. Autofocus seems to be working. So what we had before in a pointy stick was uh, avalanche. What we had before, when this space here, let's just get the, so this is our entry palette, this is our exit palette. Wheel is rotating clockwise, clockwise as you see it. Let's just find a half decent tooth like that. So what we want for our escapement to work, as I did on the drawing before, when this incoming tooth here lands on the palette frame, we want it to land about half a degree. We want the minimum amount of safe locking. We don't want it to land on the angled surface here. We want it to just land on this so-called dead surface, which as you see, isn't too bad in terms of recoil. There is a tiny bit of movement. And then the reason I think it's not too bad is because I suspect that this is kind of how the pallets were before they were worked on uh, before. So what we want is this tooth here to have just exited the pallets when this one lands on here and vice versa. So if we just run through the cycle, we've got the what would be recoil. Then as we move on to our new impulse phase, can you see there? Uh, escape wheel begin to rotate. So we move on to the impulse phase. And then when this tooth falls off here, this one is going to land on here. And we want that to land about half a degree on the safe surface like that. We don't want it to land on the, um, on the impulse phase. And the same thing here. I think it's maybe landing slightly on the impulse face at this side. Now the escape wheel is in a big old state. You can see as well that we've got more internal drop than external drop. And this is a bit unusual for me looking at the escape this way up. It's normally the pallets at the top for a European clock anyway. Well, for the, for the clocks I work on, Comtois clock, the pallets at the bottom. So when we look at drop, um, we've got, so we've got a tooth on our entry pallet, which is here on the right. So when we look at drop, that's the free angular movement of the escape wheel. We've got that much on internal. So that's the tooth moving from here to here. And let's look at external, which is the tooth moving from our exit pallet all the way around and landing on our entry pallet. So let's have a look. There's our impulse, you can see. And so we've got a bit more drop on internal. We've got a bit more internal drop than we have on external drop. Now there's nothing, as we talked about last week, there's nothing we can do about the overall amount of drop if you add up internal and external because that is a function of the thickness of this material, which hasn't changed since the clock was made. Um, and yeah, the escape wheel teeth have moved Rouen down a little bit, but that doesn't matter in terms of drop because given that they all uh, wear down the same amount, that pitch that we saw before just moves along a little bit. So the escapement doesn't have any consciousness 
of that in terms of drop. But what we can do, yeah, there's more internal drop than external drop. It's not much. And it TBH, it doesn't matter once you're on this because it's a bit of a minor miracle that it's actually working. Um, so normally to, uh, to alter that, if we think about it, if at uh, that point we increase the center distance of the uh, pallet and the escape wheel, we would decrease internal drop. And if that point we decreased, we've moved the pallets closer to the escape wheel. Um, if you imagine if, if that tooth here on the exit pallet, let's just go back to that position. If, bah, 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 bah. if that tooth was glued to the pallet and we moved the center distance together, we're obviously going to decrease this value here. Um, now, this, these pallets don't embrace even a quarter of the teeth, so it's not quite as pronounced as we'd normally expect to see, let's say, on a square escapement where the pallets embraced um, a quarter of the teeth. But, yeah, we've got a slight disparity in drop, but it isn't much. And so what I could do to even that out is to bend this uh, face towards this one a little bit, or this one towards this one, which would decrease the value here, uh, but it would increase the external value. So you could add those up a bit, but what I said before, never, ever, ever bend the pallet frame if you can help it. I've only had to do this because it's like totally desperate. Um, Yeah, uh, let's just see if you can see inside there. It's quite interesting. It's quite interesting, this says my nerdy voice, because the reason it appears to, um, and after these last three weeks, of course, nobody will ever, ever, ever want to hear about the so-called deadbeat escapement um, again, is the... Uh, tooth is landing on the locking or dead face, but because a lot of the tooth tips are curved round, it appears that there's recoil, but there isn't. It's just the fact that the escape wheel's damaged. So I am incredibly happy with that uh, minor miracle. All right, okay. A little bit too good to be true. Yeah, I'm going to have to even up the drop. And the reason for that is I can, now I've had a look through my eyeglass, is I can see on some of the teeth, and this presumably is where, and it's all conjecture, so apologies to whoever worked on this before, is where that person was before. Because what's happening, because there isn't quite enough external drop, like there, when the tooth goes like this, if you remember my, I don't know if you can see that or not, but I can certainly feel it. The tooth is scraping on the back of the, the palate, sorry, is scraping on the back of the tooth. And what we had before, of course, was somebody had ground or filed this away to generate clearance, but that is like total disaster because that reduces our impulse and increases drop. So what we can't do, yeah, it's just touching. I can, you maybe can't see it, but I can certainly feel it grating just there. So what we need to do is to move this pallet slightly closer to this one. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to have a look again through the eyeglass to see if either pallet is going to benefit from that bending over the other. So you can see that one's got a bit of recoil on it. It maybe did from new. I know we've had people on the Facebook group referred to this as a half dead beat escape, which it isn't. The entry palette looks really good in terms of being uh, dead. Gosh, I didn't realize you could talk so long about a clock escape. Amazing, isn't it?
Yeah, I mean, the, the entry palette has already got a tiny, 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 tiny amount of um, sort of recoil on it. So it kind of doesn't make any difference. What I'm going to do is uh, just bend this exit palette a little bit closer to the, um, to the entry palette. And I can do that one or two ways. I can either squidge the palette frame in like this, which will um, increase the amount of locking, of safe locking, which I don't want to do because it's already got enough. Um, it, it has got safe locking just, but it's enough is enough. So what I need to do is to essentially rotate this tooth, or this one, this palette, sorry, round a little bit, which is uh, a bit tricky, but let's just have a go at that. I don't think measuring it is going to help either. Let's just get right. because um, if I was squeezing it together, it would it would help. But this isn't going to. Maybe it would help to measure it. Yeah. Let's have a look at that. Let's see if that's any better or too much. So just to reiterate for anybody who just happens to have stepped into this and um, do not bend the palette frame, absolute last uh, resort. Bit more, haven't done much. Come on. Focus. Nope. Like it. Manual focus, it is. If in doubt, take over. So that obviously didn't make any difference. So it's been a bit. Lily livered with it, understandably, because I don't want it to snap through all this good work. Really, really be good to get this clock finished. And now we can think about moving on to our next live stream project, which is um, Derek's um, torsion pendulum clock. Right, okay, so I think we'll call that a day. So let's just have a look at it now. Again, let's look for some cooperation from the camera. So you'll notice now a couple of teeth have got burrs on them. So I'm just gonna get um, a scalpel and flick those off. So still a little bit more internal drop than external, but um, I'm not gonna worry about that. Bit more even. And the reason that one is still scraping there is not because there's a problem here, but because there is a burr on this incoming tooth. Still, that is still touching. <gasps> Frustrating. Okay, a bit more. You know what's going to happen? Don't it's going to snap. It's kind of been a bit of a theme in these live streams, hasn't it? It's like that little bit more. Is that going to be too much? Is that going to? Um, is that going to break something or is that going to be the undoing of it?
Cool. Okay, I'll just get a scalpel and flick off the spurs. A slightly um tricky now um, working with the macro lens. I'll, I'll leave it on for the time being and just try and keep everything uh, in the shot. So we don't need any blade on there. It's just showing off. Let's just get those off. Out. Which of these is bird? He has a few. Yeah, so this gift will have quite a lot of trauma. So, um, anyway. Let me just go around everyone and just flick off those later burrs. One of the things in horology that makes me most happy, uh, and there are many things, of course, apart from doing live streams, is um, when you get a machine-made screw on one of the end fields and the burr or the little curl of material that um, is there from when the screw was made is still there. I really like to see that. So this is a bit scratchy, actually. I should probably be doing it with a bit of pegwood and not the scalpel. Got a bit overexcited with the idea that the clock's actually going to be finished. You can hear the ones that have got a little fur on them. It looks quite recent. And maybe that was because somebody really struggled with this escapement. Yeah, I think that's got them all. You can actually feel with the scalpel the ones that are sort of hooky. Bit scratchy um, or shiny, some might say, which is not ideal, but I think it's been a little bit of a give myself a break for having um, gotten it working reasonably well and what I consider it to be reasonably well. Good. All right, let's put that back on that. Just uh, this. Sam says, "What are you going to do with this stuff when it's finished?" Uh, good question, Sam. I mean, I might keep it in case we do uh, ever get around to doing short courses or something. But um, we're a bit overwhelmed at the moment with stuff and clocks. <laughs> So I don't have any particular strong feelings about it. I'd like uh, all these things because we've got on our um, read repairs channel uh, the, over on YouTube, um, quite a few things lined up there and they're not sort of big, pro well, they're quite big projects, but they're not big objects, but nevertheless, they are filling up the space and it's all getting a bit crazy. So um, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. If anybody's got any uh, ideas, other than, I mean, I could just stick it on eBay, I suppose. I don't know. We've got any feelings about what we should do with it? <laughs> yeah, good yeah, they might have suggestions. Mm -hmm. We've still got the pub clock uh, thing to finish as well. Got a wheel re there to do. Let's just put this back together. Ah. 
pop these pellets back on. That's a good question, Sam. I don't know. I don't know if there's anything else to do on it. Oh, yeah, I've got to make a case back. The case back was missing altogether, if you remember, all those months ago when we started it. This doesn't want to focus, but anyway. So um, let's just... You can see the drops much more even now. Now it might be that the uh, pallets are a little bit close or a little bit deep, but I'll, I'll see when it's, I can make that final adjustment when it's all cleaned and uh, running, I think. Good, okay. So it doesn't matter whether you're working on uh, a 1720 clock by George Graham, or whether you're working on a clock like this. To me, it makes no difference. The principle is the same. And the principle of the approach as well is pretty much the same, I would say. Um, so the usual story here, we kind of got a cost benefit exercise thing going on in terms of the change to the object. You can see that heating the pallets has um, changed the color of the steel. It's also changed the color of the brass here and it will have slightly annealed these little bushings. So I could replace those, um, or I can leave those to the next person when it uh, finally wears out. There is already a little bit of shaking them, but not too bad. Um, so is that cost of change uh, more or less than the cost of making completely new pallets and so on and so forth? So a kind of um, point of discussion that we enter into with all our uh, processes like this. But we're really happy with that. Um, drops are surprisingly even, and I am 100% convinced, I don't know about the rest of the clock, we've done this one slightly weird bushing down here, didn't we? But um, I think if I can get time between now and next week and there's nothing else happening, so um, what else is there to do? Uh, other than clean the clock, I think next week we might be in a position where we can assemble it. Very happy with that. Um, that's that's cool. Uh, because it's blued, I don't feel I need to re-harden those pallet faces. I could do, um, could just heat the tips up only and quench them in water, uh, in very cold water, and that would leave them dead hard. I think what I prefer to do though is just to double, triple check and make sure everything is working, have it running for um, a couple of weeks or something, and then do that as a final. Uh, oh, good question. Uh, Derek is ahead of me. Are you going to rehab the pallets? And Franklin. Uh, yes, brass pallets will be a problem. Yeah, but I only need to rehab the tips. I was interested in softening or um, tempering the middle because that's where I bent it. I don't have to do that for the. Uh, for the tips only the, the, you're only looking at a couple of millimeters maybe three or four millimeters max that needs to be hardened so what i'll do is i'll protect the rest of the palette and so on with a um, bit of cloth that's soaked in water or cool gel or something and yeah i think i will reharden them and then just leave them dead hard and then they're done but i'm not going to do that until uh, the whole thing is finished because and you might have to remind me because i'm bound to forget um, is it time to set up the York Clock Museum? Oh, yeah. Well, it's a good point, Sam. So, yeah, I will rehab the pallets, but I'll just check it all runs first. Because, of course, the beauty of this design is you can just whip the pallets off and uh, you can do that in two minutes and then put them back on again and they're done. And, yeah, I'll just put some cool gel or something around there to protect the uh, brass bits. And, the, and, of course, the York Clock Museum already exists. In fact, I think at least there used to be an automaton museum here didn't there gone to Japan, Japan. that's gone to japan yeah lock stock and barrel uh but there's the castle museum which has got uh interesting clocks including one of those clocks with uh helical gearing by come on brain from wakefield mcdowell charles mcdowell and then there's the uh uh, Bar Convent, which has got a clock by Hindley. There's a Mansion House, which has got clocks, including some by Hindley. There's a Minster, which has got nice clocks. 
and then there's the our Fairfax House, which has got one of the best clock collections in the world of, if you like, late. 17th century clocks so yeah we've already got plenty of clock music uh, clock museums in york and uh, in fact we were fantasizing once about having a tour of this stuff so we should get around to that for next week if the covid ever finally clears off and um maybe that's it maybe this clock should be donated to uh to york um museum and art gallery i'll write my letter york's most famous uh, clockmaker of the present time. Anyway, so great. Next week, um, if uh, we're spared, we will be here uh, on Thursday again. Yeah, I think. Yeah. And um, everything crossed, we should be in the position where we can uh, put the thing together. So I'll get the rest of it, second phase of cleaning. It won't look any different from what it looks now. Uh, all this stuff is uh, staying there. I love all that um, kind of tarnishing and things and i'm still convinced that this clock was plated brass plated or something or even flash gilded when it was new to make the plates look like brass but anyway i haven't had any definitive answer on that so uh it remains to thank you all and uh, thank open uh, clock club team open clock club of course and um wish you a very happy christmas so um merry christmas Look after yourselves in this uh, tricky and weird um, sort of environment. When I think Franklin, you're the uh, Dutch are back into um, uh, back into full lockdown again, uh, and I guess that we will maybe be following suit immediately after Christmas, which is in a couple of days' time. But anyway, uh, look after yourselves, and we will see you all being well next Thursday. And who knows, we might even get this clock ticking. Maybe not, because I've got no idea how it goes back together again. But um, you can but, uh, can but hope. So really pleased with how it went this week. Thanks, everybody. See you on Facebook. Uh, and if not, then yeah, Merry Christmas and 